I'm Randolph Bell. I'm the president of the First Freedom Center, uh, which is uh, only one third of the uh, sponsoring uh, cadre here. We're very thankful to the University of Richmond, uh, representatives of the T.C. Williams Law School, of the uh, Jefferson School of Leadership Studies, um, of the arts faculty, and the uh, Department of Religion, the chaplaincy, and others have helped us to bring this forward and to work on the ensuing program at VCU. I know the uh, uh, religious affairs uh, uh, school in the School of uh, World Studies has been very much a part of this, uh, and it provides continuity in the person of Dr. Isabel Richmond, who last year was with the First Freedom Center and is our very uh, valued friend and ally at VCU. So thanks to both those organizations. Just some words on organization of this event. The four presenters whom I shall introduce momentarily will each talk for 10 minutes, making their presentations. Then they have each three minutes at their disposal to interact among themselves or undertake any kind of uh, rebuttal they might wish to, following which we entertain questions from the audience uh, and we have a microphone set up over there uh, for that purpose, uh, and we'll have it somewhat more commodiously placed for you to put your questions. Um, the First Freedom Center, just uh, explaining us, uh, advances the fundamental human rights of freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. Uh, we take seriously uh, those rights enshrined in the 1786 Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and in consequence, we take seriously the rights both of believers and of non-believers. Um, we believe that uh, these are the first freedoms because without them, a great many other human rights uh, simply would not exist, including assembly, freedom of speech, and others. Um, we hope that a plurality of views will come forward, both from our presenters and from the audience. Our presenters include Dr. Henry L. Chambers, a professor at law at the T.C. Williams Law School. He teaches employment discrimination, evidence, and criminal law in related courses. Uh, his research and publications have turned on evidentiary issues, employment discrimination, sexual harassment, voting rights, and on the linkages between constitutional and biblical interpretation. He has published widely. Uh, in the uh, Emory Law Journal, the Georgia Law Review, the Alabama Law Review. Um, he's been a member of the American Law Institute since 2002, uh, and he participates um, in lectures on constitutional law principles in the We the People program. Dr. Joanne Chula, uh, who is professor and Costin Family Chair in Leadership and Ethics at the Jepson School of Leadership Studies is a founding faculty member of that school. Uh, she teaches courses on ethics, critical thinking, conflict resolution, and leadership in international affairs. She has uh, achieved distinction and recognition, including, as, uh, uh, the university, including the university's highest award for teaching in 2003 and the uh, Outstanding Faculty Award. She has held the UNESCO Chair in Leadership Studies uh, at the United Nations International Leadership Academy and has held positions at LaSalle, Harvard Business School, the Horton School, and Oxford. Uh, she uh, uh, does research in the areas of leadership ethics, business ethics, international leadership, and philosophy of work, and has published broadly. Mimi Hanaoka of the uh, Arts Faculty is Assistant professor, professor of Religious Studies in Islam uh, here at the University of Richmond. She has uh, held the, a, a Jacob Javits a Fellowship at Columbia. Uh, she has uh, participated in a fellowship in Cairo under the aegis of the Center for Arabic Studies Abroad. She holds a PhD from Columbia University, teaches courses in Islam, Introduction to Islam, Islamic Mysticism, and Islamic political thought. Her current research interests center on the formation and articulation of Muslim identity in early Islamic Persia. Aliyah Vajid, the senior research associate at Karama 
a major nonprofit 501c3 organization in Washington and around the world, connected to the University of Richmond via Aziz al Hebri, professor of law in the T.C. Williams Law School. Ms. Vajid carries out research to develop a just and gender equitable understanding of Islam. She conducts workshops and lectures as well as educational programs on issues related to Islamic jurisprudence. She holds a BA in religion with a minor in Islamic studies from Swarthmore and an MA in theological studies focusing on Islam from the Harvard Divinity School. Four excellent panelists. Uh, as I say, they will now do their 10 minutes each, and the program will be moderated by, uh, uh, by uh, Bill Sachs of the staff of the First Freedom Center. All right, Dr. Chambers. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out this evening. It's always a pleasure to talk to groups of folks who have interest in issues along these lines. Let me take just a few moments to, to talk about the issue at hand. I don't want to take too terribly long because I only have 10 minutes and Bill will give me the hook. <laughs> the, the, the issue at hand is does religion infringe upon the rights of women? And, and I'll just give you the, the lead in first. I, I think the area of infringement is fairly narrow. In fact, it's very narrow. Some folks may say you're nuts, but the reason why I say it's narrow is because of the way that we and I define religion and women's rights or the rights of women. That is, when I think about religion as opposed to particular religions, uh, I think of what is it that religion requires of us? Its adherence or not? How do we define religion? By the same token, we ask, well, how do we define the rights of women as opposed to the rights of humans? So, so those distinctions will allow me to, to, to think my way through the, the problem and say that there's only a narrow area of infringement. So, so let me explain what, what I mean by that. When we ask what are the rights of women, as I say, we have to distinguish them from human rights. So if you're thinking health care, if you're thinking the right to, a re to reasonable work, the right to dignity of work, things along those lines, those are rights that are rights of men as well as rights of women because in theory they would be human rights. Now I, I realize you're going to say, well, health care is not a human right. Okay, okay fine, fine. Not in this country, at least. Right. It, it, it's, it's a luxury that we should all afford if possible. Fine, I get that. But, but in terms of broader issues, if we were going to talk about human rights, because we could always say that there are no such things as human rights, I, I think it's fair to say that, that, those, that most of those rights would be rights that uh, go to everybody. So what are particular rights of women sort of inherently that are inherently different from the rights of humans or the rights of men? I think it's fair to say that, that we'd have to ask what is it that differentiates women from men? And before you say, well, I assume that his parents gave him the talk about birds and bees, <laughs> the, the, the point is that, that we have to figure out that particular distinction and figure out what rights go with that. So I think it's fair to say that the primary difference from a physiological perspective with respect to women as a whole versus men as a whole is the, the issue of reproduction in large measure. Well, if we think about the particular rights of women with respect to reproduction, whatever they are, m many of those would not necessarily be considered natural rights. They're rights of society. Right? That is, what society decides those rights are would tend to be those particular rights, and, and we may say that there's a narrow or a broad range of those rights, but we'd also say that they're fairly temporal. Right? They're fairly temporal. So, so, so if we can define what qualifies as the rights of women in terms of anything that may even in theory be a natural right, I think it would have to be with respect to things that differentiate men from women, namely uh, the giving of life and childbirth. Well, well, okay, then let's ask the question about religion. What is it that religion requires of us, or what is religion? What does it do? Like I say, I'm distinguishing this from particular religions. Because certainly particular religions can have particular views 
about men, women, what have you. But the question is about religion in general, at least that's how I look at the particular question. Well, it may well be the case that religion in general thinks largely about the quality and dignity. Largely about equality and dignity. When you think about the notion of the golden rule, for example, a near universal, that near universal is about how we treat each other and how we're supposed to treat each other well. So it's fair to say that in terms of the broad run of what we would think of as being religion or the things that are common to all religions, uh, I think dignity, equality tend to be near the top. Now, here's where we have that sliver of quality question. We may well say that religion itself does concern itself with life and death. So if we want to do the Venn diagram of things that matter to religion and things that matter specifically to women as rights of women, I, I think it's fair to say that there might be a sliver there in terms of life, reproduction, possible. But that still doesn't get us to the question of whether religion necessarily, necessarily infringes upon the rights of women. It's unclear that it does in any way that we would necessarily view as being unequal. That is to say, we may have to treat folks who bear life at least religion might treat folks who bear life a little differently from those who don't, but it's unclear if religion necessarily has to infringe on any of those particular rights. Uh, although that, I imagine, might be an area of dispute among a number of folks. Indeed, one might well say that outside of the venue of life and reproduction, there may be almost no daylight between religion and the rights of women or the rights of people in general. Now, let me, let me give the caveat, of course. The caveat is that if we're talking about religious doctrine or we're talking about religious practices, clearly some religious doctrines and some religious practices are going to infringe the rights of women. D doesn't strike me as being much of a surprise there. But the reason is not necessarily because of religion as religion. The reason is because we're the ones who are interpreting religion or thinking about religion. Now folks may say, well that's, that's kind of a slender read. No, I actually don't think it is. Things change over time. Issues change over time. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to jump on my Catholic friends, but obviously uh, when you think about female priests or the lack thereof, it's an issue. Obviously, folks who are from my faith, my faith background in terms of Episcopalianism recognize that two generations ago, we'd be saying the same thing about women priests in the Episcopal Church. Right? But, but that's not necessarily religion. That's just us. Right? That's just us. So in some respects, when we think about the question of whether religion necessarily infringes on the rights of women, I think only very narrowly. Uh, now, certainly, like we say, that women can't be priests, women must submit graciously to their husbands, if we say women must dress in a particular fashion, if we talk about plural marriages, bigamy, what have you, sure, those are issues, but again, those are issues with us as opposed to otherwise. Uh, I am near the end of my 10 minutes, so let me just end with, with this piece of the puzzle. And I'll ask the question like this. Assuming you believe that there is a heaven, will there be sexes in heaven? <laughs> and in that vein, if we believe that there will be sexes in heaven, and if we believe that, re that religion necessarily infringes upon the rights of women, do we really think that heaven is going to infringe on the rights of women? Uh, I kind of doubt it, but I'm ready to hear argument in the opposite direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chula. Okay. Well, actually, Hank did a great job of warming things up for me because 
I think a big issue in contention is exactly the issue of, well, what do we mean by religion? And um, I'd like to take a different tack, because I am not a religion scholar. I'm a philosopher by training, and I think I was brought in for comic relief. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, or to be a provocateur, because uh, philosophers are that way. Um, I'm going to talk about it in terms of what I know about. And I think that I agree that religion doesn't necessarily infringe on the rights of women if you define religion as some uh, sort of pure core of values and principles, as you've talked about it, entailing those things. Here's the problem. Um, religion's not the problem. It's religious leaders and institutions that are the problem. People are the problem, not religion. Um, most of the uh, major religions in the world at the core don't deny rights to women. Um, I, I think it's interesting that because people interpret religion, uh, because people use religion, that it can be stretched in all different directions. Actually, I've always thought that Islam was a really smart religion in trying to get rid of the middleman. Uh, whereas Christianity is more of a franchise. Anybody can take part if you can get a bunch of followers. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyway, anyway. Is this uh, thing on? <laughs> Anyway, but the, the thing is that, that religion's also about power, and it's about power in all sorts of ways, and, and it's also about leadership. So I'm going to talk about what I know, which is leadership and power. Uh, the reason it's about power, obviously, God or the gods, well, they have a lot of power, and, and we look to them as people of power. But what's interesting is when humans get involved, because when you look at the history, I've been working on a book on the evolution of, of leadership. When you look at the history of leadership, the first leaders are shamans. Uh, you look in some cultures and the word for leader is the same as the word for shaman. So what's interesting is that gods and God are great powers, but they're also the way in which leaders across history and in a variety of cultures uh, have gained their own power and legitimacy. So if we take that as an assumption that people use religion as a form of power, well then when it comes to relations with women and the rights of women, you can do pretty much whatever you want if you have enough power. Um, there's, there's all sorts of interesting examples. Uh, Robert Wright's book, The Evolution of God, I think is particularly interesting in this light because he talks about how uh, when you look across many societies, uh, you see that uh, either the political leader, historically I'm talking, the political leader or the shaman are the same. Uh, in a lot of societies, religion serves the interests of society, uh, but also in a lot of societies, religion uh, serves the interest of the people running the religion in the society. And I think these are the places where uh, women's rights get trampled upon, because you can certainly make them say just about anything uh, you want. So uh, if you look, you know, just a few historical examples, um, ancient conquerors sort of understood that you didn't mess with people's religions. So, for example, Greek and Roman gods are basically the same gods. Um, and they've understood, too, that, you know, religion can be, as a source of power, we know it's a source of comfort for people. When there are crises, people turn to religion for comfort, but they do the same thing with leaders. So what's fascinating about religion and leadership is the two things run in parallel to each other. People kind of expect some of the same things from leaders that they expect from gods. They expect comfort. They sometimes, in times of crisis, uh, regard leaders rather like children to parents. Uh, and leaders can abuse this and do all sorts of things with it depending on how they respond. They can either make people stronger in times of crisis or they can abuse them and make them dependent on them. Uh, I think religion does the same thing at times and that's the space in which people run into trouble in terms of women's rights. So I would say that, you know, men have been infringing on the rights of women for a very long time. You just need to read history. There's nothing really particularly new about that. Uh, they are about um, how they constitute their societies. Uh, men have liked to own women. 
Uh, they'd like they'd like to buy and sell women. They'd like to have control over women. Uh, they'd like to have control and knowledge of who their offspring are. There are lots of reasons why men have taken control over women. So if anything, I would say religion on its own, if we could talk about the pure doctrine of it in some way untouched by the hands of a lot of people who have abused it in history, uh, is perfectly fine. Uh, but it can also be used as a weapon that actually has served for a very long time to oppress women, largely because of the way people have interpreted it, and that's why I do agree with you, Hank, uh, largely the way that men have interpreted it and the way that they've used it as a source of power. Dr. Hanaoka. Thank you. This is a, a perfect panel for me for selfish reasons because it's sort of narrowing down to what I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I want to give a few comments on religion more broadly. Um, and then I want to contextualize the emergence of Islam because I think that will go a long way to sort of explaining what I'm going to discuss. And then bring up a few examples. Um, and what I'm essentially going to argue um, falls along the lines of what, what Hank um, and Joanne have said. Um, but what I will argue is that I think religion has acted at a force that can be deeply constricting of women's rights as well as deeply liberating towards women's rights. Um, I'm going to argue that this is always con historically contingent and deeply locally contextualized. Um, so a few, a few notes about sort of religious development more broadly. Um, I would argue that all religious developments um, are indeed historically contextualized and locally contingent. Um, and I think that therefore all women's rights or human's rights, and more specifically women's rights in Islam, need to be seen within this broader um, framework. And again, at various times and places, women's rights have been deeply constricted as well as deeply liberated. Um, and I think when, that when we talk about religion, we cannot create this artificial firewall between religion and other aspects, such as history, such as literature, such as sociology, such as anthropology, as well as literature. So the question of what exactly constitutes religion, I think, is a pretty expansive question in and of itself. Um, and we might want to, I don't know, consider that, what is religion? Um, as far as the historical uh, context for the emergence of Islam, I just want to mention a few things about that sort of late antique climate, um, you know, before the seventh century. What was going on? Because I think that will sort of explain um, some ideas in Islam. Um, and what I would argue is that this was a richly fertile climate. There were Jewish communities, Zoroastrian communities, Greco-Roman communities of um, late antique religion. Um, there were indigenous Arabian polytheistic or pagan religions, um, and there was an increasing tendency, and this is sort of following what Joanne said, of, of allying empires with religions. The Byzantine Empire was a Christian empire, the Sasanian Persian Empire was often allied with Zoroastrian forces, and so, and the, you need to sort of consider um, the relationship, I think, of religion and power, that these things are often go in tandem, hand in hand, whether they're contested um, or work in a, in a convenient marriage. And I'd also argue that the early Islamic um, community overlaid pre-Islamic values um, within a new religio-ethical moral framework. And so that in this sense, we don't need to see Islam as some sort of a radical break, um, but we can contextualize it within that early Islamic um, environment. And there were certain values that were valorized. For example, courage. Um, was a value that was value uh, was a was a quality that was valorized in this sort of pre-Islamic Arabia, five, six, seventh centuries. Um, loyalty, loyalty to one's tribe. It was a profoundly patriarchal society um, and a tribal society as well. There were settled communities and there were nomadic communities, and these often had a very symbiotic relationship. But regardless, society was by and large profoundly patriarchal. Um, there were important ties of sort of guest friendship and loyalty, sort of bounds, intertribal bounds that could at times supersede um, political or economic conflicts within tribes. Um, the notion of generosity was profoundly important. Um, the concept of genealogy, where do you come from? Um, from whom do you descend? What, where do your allegiances lie become, were tremendously important. Um, and finally, and I think this is one that um, people may be more caught on to more when we talk about Islam, is the idea of honor and perhaps revenge, that these ideas may go hand in hand in tandem. Um, but what I would argue is that this 
these qualities were a construction of a group identity, but as well as the individual identity. Um, and these qualities, you will see them emerge in the Muslim tradition, in Islamic thought, um, but in a new ethical, moral framework. Um, and again, sort of to, to echo what, what people were saying, it's a profoundly patriarchal society. Um, men have generally exercised more power than women. In this sort of pre-Islamic Arabian context, it was a predominantly male identity that we're talking about. We talk about these values. Women participated as wives, as daughters, as chattel. Um, and so from this social point of view, um, these values will be seen in Islam over the centuries in a new framework. Um, so I don't think we can divorce the emergence um, of and, and the development of early Islam from this sort of broader social and historical context. Now that being said, I even get anxious talking about Islam or I get very nervous. I'm glad there's two of us speaking about Islam, um, so I'm not somehow responsible for speaking about a religion. Um, I'd also want to argue that there, when we talk about Islam, that in itself is a deeply, deeply contested notion. That there is a plurality um, of Islams, if we can say so. As, as you said, there is no necessarily central theological figure. Um, there is no pope figure that the notion of competing religious authorities has existed um, from the moment of the death of the prophet. So I would argue that um, it's not only theological differences which exist. Um, I would also say that it is who speaks for Islam. Um, do we talk about a religious scholar? Do we talk about the Taliban? Do we talk about um, the mildly Islamist party in Turkey? Um, that, that exercise a political control? Um, do you talk about your local imam? Do you talk about Khamenei? I mean, who speaks for Islam, I think, is wildly contested. And I don't think you will ever find um, a single coherent answer for that. And I'd also argue that this is a profoundly local question. That Islam looks incredibly different um, from the Uyghur Muslim communities in China, to Japan, to Saudi Arabia, to Tehran, um, to American Islam and what Islam in America looks like. Um, and this looks very different um, from Islam in Europe as it does in Islam in South Africa. And I would also say that these are also deeply contingent on questions of national identity, um, of national domestic political concerns as well as external political concerns. And that these identities, as, as, Frank, as I think Hank said, they shift over time and place. That, that nothing um, is static, um, that religion is a, is a deeply plastic thing. Um, I'd also like to talk about women and gender because the topic is does religion infringe upon the rights of women? Um, but I'd also argue that the, the role of women and what constitutes woman or an ideal woman is also very contested and shifted. What constitutes gender over time? Um, the model of the pious Muslim woman has ranged as it has in the Christian tradition, as it has in many other traditions from deeply ascetic, removed from family life, as well as being a member of the family, as a mother, as a parent, as a daughter, as a family. So what constitutes piety, um, there is no agreement on that and there never has been, um, whether you consider that sort of ascetic or family devotion as well. Um, and finally, a few topics about um, I guess dress, because we talked about what constitutes um, modesty with women. And I would say that you know, Islamic identity as it is expressed relates to a host of internal and external factors. I was just reading the news today about the niqab, the full um, face veil ban in France, and that the first fines are finally going to be instituted. Um, and there are questions of you know, can, when and how will that go to um, a broader human rights court in, in Europe. Um, but I would say that mm, the question of modest dress, including the Islamic headscarf, any number of types of headscarves, um, they wax and wane in popularity as a response to a variety of factors. These include domestic political concerns, external political concerns, war, a colonial encounter, um, a post-colonial concept of West toxification, what does it mean to be um, subordinate, subjugated, um, potentially to the West in a globalized context, and what does that mean? So I think if you ask people, 
why do you wear the veil? You will not get one single response. Some will say that is an expression of Muslim identity. Some will say it is a question of national identity, divorced from Muslim identity, um, or primarily of one of a national concern. Um, it will also relate to things like religious obligation. Um, it could also relate to some broader concept of cultural identity, um, as well as piety. People may find it acceptable at certain times in their lives um, when it wasn't at others. Um, and the final question I want to ask you, sorry, can, can secularism infringe on rights? Um, Turkey is a, a rigorously secular country. Um, and so the question of does secularism infringe on women's or human rights as well is something I want to just throw out there. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Fajid. Thank you so much for having this panel and for inviting all of us today. Um, so I'm going to look at this from a little bit more of a contemporary view. Um, the ideas that Joanne brought up about interpretation and power. Speak up. Yeah. How's that? Okay. Um, so the ideas that Hank and Joanne brought up about interpretation and power are very, very relevant um, to Islam today, as well as Mimi's remarks about historiosity and local context and the early patriarchal society in which Islam emerged are very relevant to the way that we look at Islam as it's practiced today in the United States. Um, so when we're discussing fundamental rights, how's that? Um, some that come to mind include the right to education, the right to marriage, the right to divorce, liberty, financial freedom, to choose how to live your life. Um, when we think about Islam, we often hear about how religion is restrictive of these rights for women. We hear about um, men's right to polygamy, women's lack of a right to choose her husband, uh, women's lack of a right to divorce. Uh, a man's right to beat his wife, um, a woman's lack of equality and inheritance. And we attribute all of these injustices um, to religion because this is what some Muslims do. But is this what the religion itself espouses or is this uh, what people themselves choose to do? To my knowledge, this is not what Islam espouses. Rather, in my opinion, these are misogynistic and patriarchal interpretations of the two main texts of Islam, often colored by a group's culture or their customs. Um, and the two main texts of Islam being the Quran, which is uh, believed to be the word of God sent down to the Prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel, and the Hadith, or the recorded sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad. So you could say, as soon as I start to blame religion and culture, you, um, you could say maybe perhaps my progressive gender-friendly interpretation is just as biased as this um, narrow and patriarchal interpretation that I claim um, some Muslims espouse. Um, but when you do look at the text themselves and examine where people derive such restrictive rulings on women, I think one starts to understand that sometimes these ideas have nothing to do with the text themselves, but have more to do with the ideas that these people uh, believe on their own, whether it be due to their culture, um, due the, to the role that they assign women in society already, and they usually kind of take and twist and turn the religious text to kind of match what they already believe to be true. Uh, at the same time, I understand a hesitancy to take a step back and say, well, if this is what Muslim pra Muslims practice, isn't this Islam? Um, after all, you can't just say that a religion is some kind of imaginary ideal um, that's studied by scholars or religious leaders, but not practiced by the people themselves. Religion is lived and it's shaped by people, their lives, their customs, their cultures. And in some ways, we can't necessarily pull this apart. So what I would say then is perhaps we can take a step back and look beyond the Islam that's always thrown at us by the media or, um, yeah, by the media. Um, and think about the people with whom we actually come into contact. Are they restricted by their religion? Do they seem inspired by it? What do we see with Muslims that we actually interact with on a daily basis besides what we're reading constantly about Muslims? Um, and I was told to speak a little bit about my own personal experiences. So. Um, for me, Islam has been a religion of love and compassion. Our Lord in daily supplication and prayer is known as the beneficent and the most merciful. It's a religion whose prophet's only known living descendant was a woman, and his line continued through her. It's thought that there might be other descendants that were male, but either way, his line continued through a woman. Um, it's a religion that believes that paradise is beneath a mother's feet. It is one that gives me rights as a human being and values me for my piety, my heart, and my deeds, rather than my gender, my physical attributes, my achievements, or even necessarily my intellectual capacity. Um, we could say the Quran does definitely um, distinguish between the sexes and that it acknowledges that they are different. But this distinction does not have any inherent value in social roles, 
So oftentimes Islam is looked at as um, oppressing women or keeping them within the household and not encouraging them to go and be a part of society. Um, but the texts themselves do not espouse any kind of view related to this. In fact, in early Islamic times, what's interesting is that women could even hire wet nurses to take care of their children and even to breastfeed them. So even though they bore the children, they weren't necessarily the ones responsible for taking care of them. This is a role that society put on or that people chose through their own cultures, through their own experiences, their own customs. Um, and I think this also speaks to Mimi's point about shifting attitudes with time, context, and culture. Um, religion and Islam, as I'm speaking about, is not static. It changes with people's culture, with people's um, beliefs, values. It's not just something that's static at one period of time. Um, Islam for me is also a religion that promotes equality between spouses. The Quran says that the believing men and believing women are protectors to each other and that God created you for mates amongst yourselves so that you might incline towards them and that he engenders love and mercy between you. Islam also has provided some of the most um, powerful inspirational role models. The Prophet's daughter Fatima was a very, very powerful woman. Again, she was the woman that continued his bloodline. Uh, which to me is very powerful to think that a religion could be continued under a woman when it's often a man that's the highest kind of authority. Um, but she was a woman of strength fighting the ruling caliph for her land, um, which Islam provided her. You know, the seven, in the seventh century, a woman had property rights, and that's something that we didn't get necessarily in other countries until maybe the 20th century or so. Um, let's see, it also has um, Mary, who had the divine spirit of God. Um, blown into her to bear Jesus. And so again, we see these powerful women role models even within the Quran and the text itself, uh, which to me shows that women have a very strong, prominent role in the religion and they're not somebody that's just kind of put to the side. Um, the fact that they're mentioned over and over in the text shows that there is this equality between, or equity between the genders, even if they do um, have different roles biologically. It doesn't say anything about their social roles. Um, and this to me shows that Islam does honor women. Uh, most importantly, Islam for me is a religion that does not impose anything upon me. According to the Quran, there is no compulsion in religion. And so yes, there are certain norms that we see in Islamic law about dress, certain ways of interacting with the opposite sex, worshiping, even certain things that you can eat or maybe cannot eat. Um, but they're not necessarily imposed on people. Um, and in my personal experience, they weren't imposed on me. I know, however, that this is not always the case, and for me, that's a big part of the problem. Um, we see that the, the media most often um, amplifies the small number of patriarchal, misogynistic voices over the masses of Muslims who find beauty, freedom, and serenity in Islam. Um, and again, I know that we can't necessarily have a religion in its ideal form. Religions are lived and practiced by people. But I think, again, I want us to take kind of a step back and look at religion and its pra the religion and its practitioners as a whole, rather than the fragmented picture we get um, in the media. That's also to say that I'm not necessarily denying what happens. Um, I know that young daughters are forced into marriage and women are stoned for adultery and that women don't always necessarily get equitable divorces. And all of this is done um, under the name of Islam, um, which to me is really people promoting their own personal beliefs under the guise or the facade of Islam. Um, so I definitely don't think it's good to pretend that these things don't happen, but I think it's also important to understand the root cause of these issues and from there try to battle it. So to understand that these are interpretations of a text, um, but not necessarily the religion itself. As, um, as they were saying earlier, inter it's interpretation that does this. It's not a religion itself. I think Hank was saying that if we go to heaven, right, what's going to happen? Are we going to see that women are treated any differently or their rights are taken away? And I can't imagine the divine necessarily doing that. So then who's playing around with the text? Who's making these decisions? Clearly it's people themselves. Um, so coming back to the original question, does religion infringe upon the rights of women? Um, I don't think it's women that infringe upon the rights of women. I think people can infringe upon the rights of women using the pretense of religion, which can provide them with a platform. Um, and if they have enough people that believe in this platform, it'll allow them to spread. And unfortunately, these voices are the ones that are listened to and that are amplified because you know, they're the more interesting to put into the news. It's more interesting to hear about how religion does take away a woman's right than to hear about how it, um, how it provides her with rights. It'll be really interesting to kind of hear.
discussion about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm fascinated to see how the the uh, comments have tracked and to see that we've begun to identify some pretty important areas. The Certainly the distinction between um, religion and religions, then the distinction between particular religions in theory and in practice. Uh, as a historian, I love the, the reference to early Islamic history because that invokes questions of, of social identity and social role as well as lived religious tradition. Well, all of that is in some hope of, of um, inspiring further comments. We're going to ask each member of our panel to take three minutes to respond to what's been said and then uh, we will uh, invite questions from the audience. But first, three minutes each. Plus or minus. <laughs> One of the things that, that is interesting to consider, I think, is what do we mean by sort of the rights of women? I, I, I did kind of want to hear a little discussion as to, to what might qualify as, as rights of women as opposed to rights of men, for example. That is, do, are there rights of men separate from the rights of women, or is it just human rights for men and then women's rights is a little something extra. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Uh, the, the, sort of the second piece I, I think where we, we may end up going is to ask whether religious doctrine in some ways necessarily privileges one group over another because one group for a certain amount of time may be somewhat incapacitated, particularly during the life-giving time period. Uh, or we might call it pregnancy instead. So in some <laughs> respects, it, it may be worthwhile to, to at least consider whether that particular issue is one that has any traction in terms of how religion deals with it, because I, I think it's probably the most controversial one, so I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear about that. Um, the other piece is whether or not fundamentalism has anything to say, sort of the notion of reading text, whether that has anything to say about questions of, sub of submission um, to folks. Uh, and the last piece is whether or not religion in general is restrictive of human rights. That is to say, to the extent that Many religions, although not all, many religions assume that there is a divine of some sort and that there's a requirement to be obedient to the Almighty. Does that restrict human rights in a way that just trickles down a little more harshly on women than necessarily on men? I said that was going to be the last piece, but actually there's one, one, just one last piece. To the extent that that religion may well take us away from a Leviathan, is it possible that religion, and here I'm just trying to play off of Joanne, is it possible that religion actually is a benefit for women it, in that it suggests a different way of thinking about life and how to get things in life as opposed to simply knocking someone over the head and getting it that way? So I, I'll just sort of throw out those comments. They were scattered, they were random, but, but there are a number of them. So. <laughs> oh, good, so I can have scattered comments so go too. For it. <laughs> well, I want to pick up on the, I mean, maybe at issue is the question of whether we're really talking about rights or some other kind of disadvantage whatsoever. So, I mean, because you think of rights as a particular kind of Western construction. Uh, and maybe that's not what we're talking about. Uh, maybe it's more something about advantages or disadvantages in some kind of way. And then you say, well, what are those disadvantages? And you mentioned Leviathan, and I started thinking about religion as restrictions on freedom and in a way of putting together a civil society. So if we looked mm -hmm. at religion in that way, 
um, it's always been used as a kind of moral system. So I think what we were all kind of egging towards was the really good stuff in religion is the moral system that allows us to live well together, right? And, and, and that's what everybody likes about it. And then around that core is all of this, these fiddly bits that people <laughs> stick in uh, about, you know, whether you eat pork or not, or, you know, uh, whether you're, you're, you know, supposed to do this on Saturday or, or all of those kinds of things. And then, of course, who came up with the idea that the Pope was infallible? I can imagine that conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and so all of these things get added on, but I mean, I think what makes religion great is it allows human societies, if it's done right, to flourish. What makes it really awful are the things that, that we sort of were alluding to, that it is awful if women have to be completely covered as they are in Afghanistan where they can hardly see where they can't go out of the house, when under the Taliban they couldn't get doctors. There's something about that notion of religion. The reason why it's not a moral notion of religion is because it doesn't at all contribute to human flourishing in any meaningful kind of way. And I think that could be the litmus test for whether religion harms men or women is do you have religious practices? I mean, female circumcision, that does not contribute to human thriving in terms of communities and people being healthy and being able to flourish in any meaningful way. It, it makes people really sick and makes it hard to have babies. So, I mean, and I'm not saying that's a religious practice, but the point is that maybe that's the litmus test of the good stuff of religion is simply you know, does it, it's an ethical test. Does it do harm to people? Does it allow people to live together? Uh, does it treat people uh, equitably? And equitably doesn't mean the same. Equality doesn't mean sameness. So I think the point you were trying to get at is that there may be something different about some situations that females have that are different than men's. That's true, but then when we talk about equity in terms of, of the Western notion of rights, we're talking about something different than sameness. And I don't think anyone would want to say equity means this, the exact same, because circumstances change. So I, I have questions for you two, because I really love both <laughs> of your presentations. You are terrific. And um, here's one question. Is how is not driving cars in Saudi Arabia <laughs> related to camels? I mean, did people in the Quran, did women drive camels and horses in the Quran? And if so, how, do, how, does, how does a culture get away with justifying things like that using the Quran? Because I, I have always been fascinated by this. And I, I just thought maybe you could open the book and you know where. There's got to be women on a camel somewhere, aren't there? Well, in fact, there is a very famous battle called the Battle of the Camel. Okay. Um, in which the prophet's wife was on a camel. All right. Um, Good. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess I'd like to sort of maybe address maybe Hank first and then, and then mention sort of uh, what you said, maybe open up some other questions for you too. Um, in terms of, you know, are there practices that are not equal or inequitable? Certainly in Islamic law, in the Quran, in the Hadith, so the, the revelation as well as the sayings and deeds of the Prophet, it's certainly true that women are not guaranteed the same rights as men in terms of particularly of laws of personal status. For example, inheritance rights are clearly delineated. Um, there are certain legal schools that may differ somewhat, but generally women clearly inherit less than men. Um, in terms of divorce, there are divorces that are the women's prerogative, which have various consequences for what will happen with child, um, with custody, with dowry, with how the woman leaves the marriage. Um, and finally, there are um, uh, rules regarding sort of property and personal status as well. And if I could give you some historical context for that, it is true that the treatment is unequal. But why? And if we consider the historical context during the time of the emergence and the development of Islamic law in the first few centuries, it's true that women inherited less. The rationale was that they were under the custody of men. So why would a woman inherit as much if she is under the nominal or very real custody of her male, particularly agnate, so male side brothers, relatives? Um, so there is some historical context for why that is the case, if we could ground it in that. Um, and I do want to echo sort of what you were saying, Joanne, is that, that equality need not be perhaps, um, a, it need not necessarily be what is equal. Um, maybe we need to consider what is equitable. Um, again, equal, same-same does not necessarily mean equitable. Um, if people are guaranteed the same thing, 
Um, and I guess the final thing I want to sort of con sort of consider from from the perspective of religious studies is what role does secularism play, and what do we mean by secularism as opposed to religion? Is it the absence of religion? Is it a more French concept of some sort of laïcité um, that comes out of a long historical trajectory? And what do we mean when we talk about secularism, maybe in America or in response to religion generally? Is it equally um, constricting or expansive of, of women or individual human rights? And that could be something to, to toy with um, in tandem. Okay. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> no, no, that was good. I'm trying to figure out where to start here. Um, yeah, I definitely would chime in on the equitable versus um, equal. I think what's interesting in um, Islam is that you've got different roles, but they're not looked at as unequal. They're looked at as equitable and just as different roles. And so, you know, the woman bears a child, fine, but that doesn't make her any less equal to a man. Um, uh, also, the, the ethical test was a really, really interesting point. Um, and thinking of FGM is something that's always is always something that's been um, very difficult to me. Just, um, but then I realize that it's not something that's necessarily espoused by Islam. It's something that's very cultural. At the same time, I wonder when you go into a society and you know that something's harming someone, how do you how do you react to it? Um, it's someone's personal cultural view, and so you don't really want to take away from that. At the same time, you know that it's harming people and kind of where's the line to be drawn there? And so that's something that would be really interesting to talk about. Um, and we, you know, we talk about dress and uh, women being able to come in and out of the house. And if these are views that are okay by the women, are okay with the women, uh, can we impose um, a different dress on them? I'm not, well, maybe leaving the house is probably something that's different. But, you know, if they're okay with a certain kind of dress, we look at, you know, France and other places. How can we tell them not to dress that way? Um, whether it's for religious reasons, political reasons, you know, as, as Mimi was saying, when you ask somebody about how she dresses, um, or you know, whether she chooses to wear a headscarf, it's for a variety of reasons. I know a bunch of women that you know put it on after 9/11 because it was a form of political protest for them. Um, it was a form of, uh, it was a symbol for them. And so there's there's just so much more to these issues than uh, necessarily even religion. Um, another thing, and I know this is. It's a little bit of a touchy topic, um, but polygamy is another one that I think about. Um, and it's something for me growing up in the United States is, is just, I can't, it's abhorrent. I can't even think about it. But at the same time, if um, you look at it in its historical context, um, during the prophet's time, women were taken care of by men. As Mimi said, it was, you know, they were under the custody of men and men provided for them, whether it be their fathers, their brothers, their husbands. Um, and they thus fared better in a polygamous marriage than not married at all. And then if you look at certain contexts in societies today, I had taken a class with a Nigerian um, lawyer and she, she practiced Islamic law and fought a lot of stoning cases. And you know, she brought up the point that in Ni Nigerian society in some places functions very similarly to the Prophet's time where women fare much better in even a polygamous marriage than on their own because they'll not, they might be on the streets in that way. That's not to say that I would, I would encourage this, you know, a polygamous marriage, but in that society, can we then take away that right? Um, I think in the end you have to go and you know, change societal attitudes and values, but that's something that takes a lot longer to do. Um, and so you can, you, know, you can fight for that over time, but in the meantime, can we take that right away if it protects women? Um, and I think, I don't know if it was Hank or Joanne that had brought up the idea of religion protecting women and giving them rights um, that they wouldn't necessarily have. If you look at the Islamic marriage contract, for instance, um, a woman is given a bridal gift upon marriage. And if this contract is not allowed in maybe a United States court of law, she could lose that right in a divorce. She could lose the, the money that she was given um, under Islamic law by her husband uh, because that contract may, may or may not be valid in the United States court. So it's interesting to kind of look at um, the interplays of the two different kinds of laws and uh, the rights that a woman can get from religion and maybe the rights that are taken away. But again, are these, as we were saying earlier, are these rights taken away um, by people or by the religion itself? So, yeah. Thank you very much. Let me uh, be sure uh, first to encourage all of you who are here to come back on October the 27th to this very room, the Moot Court, for uh, the second of our programs this fall on fundamentalism and the rights of women. So thank you very much for the reference to 
fundamentalism. Uh, I'm, this is a wonderful panel, and it's wonderful to see how the discussion has advanced because I think uh, you have really begun to explore some of the depths of, of the question um, here, particularly the distinction between uh, equality and equitable, but also helping us to see some real life instances of, of notions of, of rights, if you will, or, or practices um, that perhaps um, expand the vision of, of all of us. Now, for a few minutes that we have remaining, we invite any of you to come forward to the microphone here um, with your questions. Do we have any questions? Do I need to come to the microphone? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi. Is this on? Yes. I can't tell standing here. You do have a lot of strength in your voice. Indeed. Um, some 40 years ago I was coming of age and at that time uh, the huge debate around was uh, whether to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution for women and of course no one, my children, have never heard of the Equal Rights Amendment today. And so in hindsight I look at that and I wonder why why was that never ratified? That, um, and having listened to what you've uh, discussed here tonight, uh, one of the, the issues that comes to my mind as so very important, in spite of the fact that we today still do not have an equal rights amendment for women, although we did just, just have the Lily Ledbetter legislation passed, thank goodness. Uh, although it's going to take a long time before women actually have equal pay for equal work in this country and a lot of piecemeal legislation before we ever get to that. But, you know, given all of the different, the, the diversity in the country that we live in, all the different religious views and, and beliefs, I uh, am so grateful that we have the foundation of the separation of church and state in this country and the secular country that we live in that does not allow uh, for a religious group to um, put forth that a woman should be stoned to death or a woman should wear this or a woman should have her um, reproductive rights um, curtailed in any way. And so what I would like to put out to you as a question is, what are your views on the separation of church and state in the United States? Do you want to start? You're the lawyer. <laughs> we need a lawyer for this one. Yeah. Well, it, it, part of it depends on what we mean by the separation and whether there should be a separation. Of course, I look at my friend Ellis West over there, who's who, who has an entire book that deals with the first couple of clauses of the First Amendment. I, I'm not sure that the separation between church and state is quite as necessary as folks believe. If by a strict separation we mean religion has to stay out of the public square. If, on the other hand, what we mean is that religious doctrine ought not guide public policy, okay, I'm, I'm with that. But if we literally mean we need to take religion out of the public square, I would, I would go in a different direction. I, I, I will have to say one thing about the equitable versus equal thing, and, and here I, I really will throw the bomb into the middle of the room, <laughs> and that is I must say that when I hear equal versus equitable, I really hear Plessy versus Ferguson. I really hear the notion of, oh, 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 they're just different roles. We swear they're different roles. Mm -hmm. Nuns just want to be nuns. Priests just want to be priests. And they just serve different purposes. And I say, wow, okay. By the same token, when you mention the Equal Pay Act, it's kind of, when you, when you mention the Lily Ledbetter Act, it's interesting because one of the things I teach is employment discrimination. So the Equal Pay Act of 1963 was passed before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 we just keep ignoring it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in some respects, 
we have all the tools at our disposal to do what we need to do from an equal or from an equitable perspective, uh, but it's a question of whether we want to do it or not. And we got to have some want to as opposed to, to merely hoping to, which is a long way to not answer your question other than to say, <laughs> keep religion in the public square, keep it out of, the, out of public policy, largely. But I would, I would raise the question, can you really, is, is that possible? I mean, what happens when it becomes a part of the public square? Is, there can be a kind of bleeding into public policy. And so I think it's a nice distinction, it's a great idea, but I think in practice, I, I think we ought to err more on the side of keeping them out of the public square if being in the public square is going to mean that it's going to end up hitting into public policy, which I think in a lot of areas it has started to do so today. It's certainly possible. I, I do think of the religious basis for a lot of what the Civil Rights Movement talked about and the concept that at least it had to be in the public square. I just don't think that random African-American man from Atlanta gets to do what Reverend Martin Luther King does. <laughs> I just don't think he gets to preach the things that he preaches and he reaches the people he reaches unless he has that collar on. Although actually he didn't wear a collar, but you get the point. <laughs> <laughs> You Other to, thoughts, yes, please. Sure. I mean, I, I choose to live in America. Um, so insofar as you can construe that I enjoy living in America, sure. I mean, I think that there are very productive uses for a separation of church and state. Um, the question of how much can we, how much wiggle room is there, how much plasticity is there between that border of church and state, um, my anxiety would be which religion and what religion and how do we interpret it. Um, that would be my greatest anxiety with lessening um, a separation of church and state, given the historical context of the United States. Um, and I think it is impossible to separate um, any country's long history from the political implementation of, of separation or conjoining of church and state. Um, I feel like as someone who works on Islam, I feel obligated to speak about Iran. I don't know if that's sort of lurking with like the giant Islamic elephant in the back of the classroom. Um, and certainly, right, the, the fact that Islam, uh, Iran had an Islamic revolution and is in fact ruled in some extent by um, a religious guidance. That said, you would need to also historically contextualize um, what the monarchy was like under the Shah of Iran. Um, you need to also consider the long semi-colonial um, relationship between the British Petroleum Company um, and various other historical actors as well. So to say that separation is always necessarily good everywhere, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. But to say that have I found it to be a productive experience in the United States, um, I have. But that's a, that's a personal opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree that it it does function very well in the United States to keep them separate, but I think, as Joanne was saying, it's almost impossible to keep them separate. Um, religion is in the public square, and I think it's all, you can't not have it in the public square because it's such an important part of people's lives. Religion is kind of what, what shapes a person's being in many cases. Um, whether or not they follow something, um, you know, there is something in the back that, that kind of shapes you as a person. Um, and that said, we've seen it affecting public policy because it's in the public square. Um, in a lot of ways recently, you know, things like same-sex same -sex marriages, abortion, all of um, what religion the president is, is of, right? Um, these things shouldn't necessarily be in the public sphere, but, or in public policy matters, but, but they are. Um, and it's, it's very mixed because they're part of, they are part of the public square. And as much as we'd like to say there is a separation of, of church and state, and I mean there is for the most part, the fact that these debates enter in the first place, um, to me, says something a little bit different. So. Thank you. Ben, you had a, you were going to ask a... <laughs> Why does Will comment the question? Thank you all very much. I, I think your presentation was not only well documented, as was the evidence you stated, but I have a concern, is I think there's a huge and enormous difference between your comments and the public perception of the rights of women being infringed upon as a result of religion. Uh, I think it's true with young people. I think it's true with adults. 
Uh, again, I consider myself having been an educator all of my life, or most of my life, and I, I don't think that there is even a remote understanding among young people and among the media today with respect to this particular topic. As a matter of fact, I think the media would be horrified if they thought they couldn't in some way project from time to time the enormity of the infringement of differences as a result of, of gender. So it, again, it's just a comment. I, I love what you said. I think you all did a wonderful job. But somehow or other, we have the task of educating the public that culture, practice, doctrine is different from constitutional, statutory, the differences among the various countries of the world, and there are huge distinctions, as we know. But I hope you agree with my <laughs> thought. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I will ask the, the question in terms of reproductive rights, for example, does religion tend to infringe women's reproductive rights? I just asked that question. I'm not answering it. <laughs> I would give it a resounding yes and a resounding no. I mean, I think, I, I don't, I mean, I think it's, there are so many answers that are all going to be locally contextualized. So that would be my weak way of weaseling out of it is to give you it's <laughs> to give you is to give you both right and and I yeah I'll leave it at that and if you want to speak to Joanne or, or um, yeah just to kind of address your question or your comment it's absolutely true the media would sit here and be absolutely horrified and would be speaking up and you know taking up arms immediately um, but I think this is, I mean, in regards to Islam, which is kind of what I focus in, I think this is what a lot of Muslim feminists are trying to do right now, um, to kind of, to look at what's being said and what's, even what's being done, and understand it from within the text. Understand what the texts themselves say, and how these people are getting these types of interpretations. How are they coming to the conclusion that you can stone a woman if she commits adultery? Um, and where is this coming from and what do the texts themselves actually say and what they're, you know, what they're working to do is um, to educate people and to do this from within the tradition itself. I can't go in you know, to Pakistan as, as a Muslim feminist American woman and say, well, you know, what you're doing is completely wrong. This doesn't, this doesn't jive with our rights. I have to go there and um, pick up their texts and show them that this is not in line at all with the religion that you say that you practice. And you know, and the media is not interested in that, unfortunately. But but this is what people are doing, um, hopefully, in order to make some kind of change. Maybe if I could just also add, I think we haven't really discussed the notion of class that much, or socioeconomic, yeah. um, educational access class. Yeah. But I think that makes an enormity of difference. Whether you are living in a rural community or an urban community, whether you come from um, old money, landed money, gentry money. Um, whether you are poor, whether you're young. I mean, I think all these notions of socioeconomic and educational class will impact a woman's role within a religious tradition, within a particular faith, within an even more localized community. Um, that someone that is extraordinarily poor living on the streets of Cairo will have a very different experience um, from, a, from an educated Muslim professional woman living in Mohandasin. Definitely. And in terms of education, that's a big thing. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the big scary word madrasa, which is, you know, just like an, a school. But if you look at Islamic schools in certain places, I take Pakistan because that's what I'm very familiar with. Um, if you look there, how many, how many children go just because their parents can't afford um, to feed them and to take care of them? They go into these schools, they're fed, they're taken care of, and then they're fed these extremist views that, you know, they're coming from another country that, you know, we don't necessarily have to name. but. Um, but you know how much of this is due to their socioeconomic class, and how much how much of it can be changed with education, um, with with uh, development, and that type of change. Other questions, Chris. I'd like to ask a question going back to Professor uh, Chambers. What you said, um, I don't know what women's rights actually are. You know what I hear is that. Um, Women have the right to get a divorce. Women have a right to inherit property, which are the same as men's rights. Women have the right to vote. In, you know, in our country, I'm talking about. Um, but what exactly? I wonder if, if the panel could give some examples of uh, specifically women's rights. And I'm thinking, you know, do women 
have a universal right to breastfeed or breastfeed in public or, you know, where, where do we go? Um, so I'm curious about that. Yeah, when I was originally, I had forgotten to address this earlier, when you first asked that question, the only thing I could think of is that women's rights are the same as men's rights, but the reason that we keep bringing up inequality in women's rights and religion is, I think, because we think some of the rights that both men and women, men and women are supposed to have are taken away from women. That's, that's the only way that I could understand it, that they're ideally the same, but that um, it's believed that religion just takes certain rights away from women only. Um, in terms of breastfeeding in public and that kind of thing, I'm not really sure. I mean, you know, I will ask a, a slightly different question to expand it, which is, are there such things as human rights? And, and I ask that because when the suggestion was made that in context we can't impose our values on other people, well, kind of the whole point of it being a human right is we're not imposing our values on anybody Everyone has the same value. So I'm kind of curious as to, to whether we think that there are such things as universal human rights. I mean, we realize that the UN has declared some of them, but is there one? Is there a right to education? And if so, why? Uh, is, is there a right to health care? If so, why? Uh, or is everything context laden, which would suggest that there are no human rights? I'm, I'm curious as to, to what you all think about that. Well, I find, I find the, the whole construction of rights, I've always found it a really difficult concept because it, it is loaded and it and of course the UN declaration is very much a Western document and and of course the US isn't in compliance with a whole bunch of things in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. I mean it is sort of funny to look we'll do at the good ones. Yeah yeah I mean we're we're missing out on a whole lot of those. It's, it's really uh, it's stunning. But I I I would you know I'm glad you brought up this issue of whether you know just because there's another culture doesn't mean mm. it's a good culture. And, you know, I, I have this debate with my students all the time when we talk about ethical and cultural relativism. Yes, we respect cultures, we, we have an obligation to do that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because they think it's right, it actually is right. So then the question that nobody wants to get into these days is really the broader question, you know, so what are we talking here? Violation of human rights? Are we talking about basic notions of dignity? Are we talking about uh, freedom, liberty? What are the big questions? But I think in the world we live today, if we don't make judgments, if we just say it's okay for everybody to do whatever they want mm -hmm. anytime, it's problematic. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's, that's the difficulty of formulations. And, and sometimes religions are able to transcend these borders and make their critique because there are people who belong mm -hmm. to that clan of mm -hmm. religion across boards. But um, as individuals, I think it's a really dangerous moral stance to take because it pretty much says anything goes. And, and the even more dangerous one is just because a religion thinks it's a good idea to do something certainly doesn't mean it's something that we need uh, to support. I mean, if, if there was a religion, well, there was a sort of a religion that supported apartheid in South Africa. I mean, just because it had the backing of certain churches certainly doesn't mean that we should respect that practice by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So I think that the human rights thing, it's a really difficult one that needs, and, and maybe it's not the best term, but I think that there's a moral vac vocabulary that's rich enough to have that conversation. And I don't think in, in, in this era of globalization that we have we can opt out of that conversation at certain levels. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely one that I'm always afraid to kind of, you know, take a stance on on either side because um, either way you kind of find yourself violating someone in, in some way or another. You know, on the one hand, I don't want to say that, um, you know, we should be allowing people to um, engage in any kind of harm. I always think of, like I said earlier, FGM is always that kind of key case for me because, yeah, it's someone's culture and who am I to go in there and tell them that they're wrong at the same time if it's harming people, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you allow it to continue to happen? Um, and when we think about the UN Declaration of Human Rights, I always think about, um, there's an anthropologist named Lila Abu Lughod and um, she does a lot of work in Egypt. And she's written about how, you know, the UN Declaration was written in a post kind of World War II era by a certain number of countries and it's very kind of Western leaning. Um, so I don't know if there's, you know, if there's any talk of relativizing it more towards different kinds of cultures, but either way there is still going to be that line that needs to be drawn as to, you know, what is harmful, what is not, how do we determine that, and, and then what rights do we have to go in and, and impose that onto somebody.
And it's, it's kind of a really scary thing to do either way at the same time. Yeah. Well, the baseline is physical harm. Yeah. I mean, you can start with a real yeah. fundamental basis. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. It's a real baseline. Right? Yeah. So is it possible for us to derive a generalized notion of rights that could be applied equitably um, to men and to women and that would in some sense or other uh, transcend uh, contextual realities that would that would presume to be equally applicable in all circumstances regardless because and I think the phrase human flourishing surfaced in one of your presentations um, that suggests that there's something that's generalizable uh, is that do you truly believe that to be the case so in other words is there a kind of norm that we expect uh, all religions to honor by whatever doctrinal means they get there. In an ideal world, I think, ideal. but I don't think anybody would ever agree. <laughs> There's always going to be someone on the outside that, that won't agree to it, or there will always be little clauses, but, but I think even the little clauses allow us to come a little closer. So. Yeah, I guess part of it depends on what the nature of the religion happens to be. One of the things that I was talking to a group of folks, or talking with a group of folks in the last couple of weeks is, if you believe your religion is right, and someone else's conflicts with that, what do you do? Do you have an obligation to at least engage? In order to explain to them, I swear, I, 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 I'm not doing this to impose myself, but I, I just want to help you get to heaven. What do you do? Because <laughs> right. if you don't join with me, my God, you're not going there. <laughs> At that point, it becomes kind of interesting in, in terms of what's universal and what's not. I mean, if, if, if my particular religion, not mine, but if one's particular religion requires that they go out and try to explain to people why they're wrong, Is there a norm there? You know, is there a norm that says, okay, after a while, just give it a rest, all right, pal? Just give it a rest. <laughs> and let bygones be bygones, and if they want to go somewhere else, let them go. I, I'm not sure how you, you do that. And in terms of a religiously plural society, it's actually fascinating to ask the question, why would people who believe they're right about someone else's salvation want to allow there to be other religions that don't respect the fact that those people are going to go somewhere else. That, I think, is an interesting question. Not to say that I want to get away from religious pluralism. I, it's a good thing. But it's kind of interesting. If you were in a dominant position, a dominant religion, why wouldn't you impose a religion on someone else if you think you're right and you think your God is right? So are you uh, suggesting that, that a generalizable notion of rights could conflict with notions of religious freedom? Well, I, I think it sort of gets back to Joanne's notion that because of the way we talk about rights, it's such a Western construct that it's hard to, to think about rights without that original construct. And if you got away from the original construct, then, then maybe yeah, you could. Right. But once we get away from the original construct, we're not having a discussion about rights anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, you know, it gets back to it, are we right and other people are wrong? <laughs> or. <laughs> You know, are we going to just let bygones? It's an interesting, it's an interesting question, and, and and one that I think requires some maybe wine or something. Or, <laughs> or do rights serve as a kind of uh, social compact? Yeah. To which we all give um, our allegiance, our adherence, perhaps, uh, regardless of what religious or non-religious path we take to them. Is that is that the case? Is this a social compact? But it, but it gets it speaks to something else. I mean, I think getting back to your original statement, what is religion? Is if if what you're disagreeing about is something that's a matter of faith that people mm -hmm. have, that that's a pretty tough nut to crack. But around religions is all this other stuff about practices that are affiliated with that religion. What they think is right and wrong in particular. Okay, whether it's, you know, um, not, not using electricity on the Sabbath or, or some practice like that. And so the question you have to ask yourself, and I, I think that both of you touched on it, was, you know, some of these practices have to do with things that happened a long time ago, mm -hmm. and they've become sort of 
traditions. And I don't necessarily, I see them more as customs than mm. seriously morally laden with mm. issues. Whereas going to heaven and hell, that's, that's a, I, I don't know if that's morally laden, but it's, <laughs> it's unpleasant if you're going to hell. Um, <laughs> but those are different issues. So, so one has to figure out what, what can you have a rational discourse about that matters in a moral sense about religion as opposed to just faith sense. Now, you may really believe that I'm going to go to hell, and maybe I will go to hell. But the question is, do you have an obligation to stop me, and to whom? How, how do you construct that? Is it, well, you have an obligation maybe to God, but only if, if I b don't believe in your God, then I don't see what, I don't see what, can you have moral obligations to people that other people don't think exist? Well, I think that's... Yes. That, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you can if you believe in that yes. person. exactly. But exactly. I don't need to... Res I, do I, I can respect that you have that belief, but I don't need to respect, that, respect your moral obligation to that person to, to transform me. Because cause you're telling me you're doing it because, you know, that's what God wants you to do, and I'm saying, well, I don't know him. Right. And so I think that you, you, ha you have to sort of parse out what kinds of issues are at hand. If they're yep. theological issues, that's one kind of debate. If they're questions of, of you wanting to change somebody's life because of what you believe in, I think that's another question, too, that gets us more into the area of religious tolerance right. than some of these practices. Yep. Do we have any further questions? Do we have any further remarks from our panel? I'm going to invite Dr. Isabel Richmond to come forward with some concluding remarks. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, panelists, for a very interesting evening. I uh, have been sitting here wondering whether religion does infringe upon the rights of women, and it turns out maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> So it's a good thing that this is a series because the answer is still to be determined. Um, can religion ever disentangle itself from the clutches of patriarchy? Some people think yes. We will see. Are there different rights for women than for men? Perhaps. Um, on that note of suspense, uh, I invite you all to return to the next few uh, programs in our series. The last two, uh, will, the first two are here at the University of Richmond, the last two are at VCU, where the Religious Studies Department is developing a major in uh, social justice, to which uh, rule of law is a key element. And I think uh, the people on campus there will have a lot to say about these questions too. Please do rejoin us and thank you for coming this evening. <laughs>